Thank you, Father Brendan. Father Brendan, as many of you know, is, is one of my best friends, and so it's, this is, it's like two kids who get to do these things, which is sort of ridiculous. I'm also uh, uh, aware um, of how, how ridiculous it is that, that I'm speaking tonight, made even more so by the fact that this is being recorded, uh, following after uh, Dr. Larry Chapp and uh, Dr. Schindler, both very nationally respected, learned uh, theologians. I I'm none of the above. Uh, just, just a priest of this archdiocese, but happy uh, to be here with so many uh, friends also from the ecclesial movement, communion and liberation. On behalf of all of us, it's, it's such a joy to be with you and to share a bit about our founder, Monsignor Luigi Giussani. It's a special privilege to have the Archbishop with us this evening, and so your grace, thank you for, for being here. Many of you uh, who are not uh, of the movement, communion and liberation, probably have never heard of this man, Monsignor Luigi Giussani. Yet this man has given birth to a beautiful movement in the life of the church and has given the church a beautiful gift in a method of approaching the reality of faith in the modern world. There are many here who could speak perhaps more learnedly about him and some here who even knew him personally. After our talk this evening, we have a series of panels on the side, and I invite you to, to take a look to peruse them. And also, we have a, a booklet that everyone can take with them. Some of the, the members of the movement will also be around and be happy to, to engage in conversation and to share their own experiences with you. And so, uh, please, please, uh, please do that. So first, the basics. Who is Monsignor Luigi Giussani? Monsignor Giussani was born in 1922 in Desio, Italy, just outside of Milan, into a house that he described as rich in music but poor in bread. His mother, Angelina, was a devout Catholic, and his father, Beniamino, was a socialist sympathizer with a profound love for beauty. Don Giussani shared how, as a young boy, his mother, seeing something as they would walk along, would often say this phrase, how beautiful is the world, how great is God. Come bello mundo e come grande Dio. In this simple phrase, his mother taught him very much. This mother, who was a woman of simple education, educated the heart of her son to the way that he would see reality and something that he would develop and share in his life as a priest. All of reality is a sign that points beyond itself, that the world points to the creator of all things. The world points to God. And our heart is made to understand these things, to see them and to judge them as signs of something that lies beyond. Our heart is constantly seeking after a correspondence, something that matches up with its needs. The important thing here is that his mother was not a woman of great learning. This way of seeing the world in which she educated her son is not then something that is reserved only to those with extensive education or incredible intelligence, but rather is something that is open to everyone, to anyone who is willing to look at reality, to judge reality against the needs of their heart, and to seek in the world around them that which the world points to, that which lies beyond, that which our heart is made for, to be open to all things and to see in them the presence of Christ. Don Giussani entered seminary for the Diocese of Milan at the tender age of 10, something that we would never do now, but something that was very common in, in his time. And so much of his academic education, in fact, most, not all of his academic education, was in this environment. But this built on the education of the heart that he had received as a child, both from the devout faith of his mother and from his father's profound love for beauty. One episode from his time in seminary shows how these many threads of his life come together and have shaped the man that he would become. Speaking of his education in seminary, Don Giussani said that if he had not met Monsignor Gaetano Corti, 
or had not had Monsignor Colombo's literature class, Christ would have been just a word that belonged in theological musings. For Monsignor Colombo, he learned a love of literature. And indeed, he spent one month of his time in seminary while in high school, memorizing the poems of the Italian poet Giacomo Leopardi. One of these poems, To His Lady, Giussani used to secretly recite as his act of thanksgiving after communion, something I don't think any of our seminarians do today. Giussani used to secretly recite this, and, and as he, he did, something struck him. As he said, one day, everything came like a surprise of a beautiful day. When a teacher in my first year of high school, I was 15 years old, read and explained the first pages of John's Gospel. You have to remember that in the old form of the Mass, this first chapter of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. These words were read at the end of every single Mass. As he says, he goes on to say, in this lecture, he was told, quote, the word of God, in other words, that from which all things are made, was made flesh. And so beauty was made flesh, goodness was made flesh, justice was made flesh, love, life, and truth were made flesh. Being not in the realm of ideas, it became flesh. It is alive among us. And so in this moment, this beautiful day that he describes, he realized that the love for which Leopardi, the poet, longed, that love about which he wrote, the love that is in every human heart, that is the love for which every human heart is made. And it's not just somewhere out there, it's not merely an idea, but that it is here. It is a present presence. It is in our midst. All that we long for has become flesh and dwells among us. Later in life, Father Giussani would use a series of these diagrams to explain a number of his, his teachings. And one diagram relates to this particular reality. In it, you have a line going across the bottom, showing the march of, of history, the march of time. And above, you see an X. That X being what every heart desires, our longing, what it is that we're seeking after. Coming from this march of history, a series of arrows seeks after that X. A reminder that people in every time seek after fulfillment, seek after the answer to all things, the meaning to all things. The unique message of Christianity, what Monsignor Giussani reminded us time and time again, is that that which we are seeking, that which all of humanity longs for, which the human heart is made for, comes down and enters into history. As St. John's Gospel tells us, was made flesh and dwells among us. And so what we long for, the fulfillment of our desire, is not out there, but is here, is something capable of being seen, of being encountered in the flesh. And as a result then, nothing is a part from him who has made, been made flesh and dwells among us. Nothing in our experience is without meaning or without purpose. Nothing can be bracketed out or ignored. All of reality is capable of pointing beyond itself. And therefore, all of reality, even the most troubling and difficult parts of reality, is ultimately positive because it points to something beyond, something that our heart longs for. After ordination, Monsignor Giussani pursued advanced studies and began teaching in seminary. This was the course that he thought his life would take until he began to have a series of encounters that would change his life. In this period, early in his priesthood, he began to encounter more and more young people, both in conversation and in the sacrament of confession. One particular episode, while driving on a train, he entered into a conversation with a group of young men. Walking away from this encounter, he was struck by something. He was struck by the fact that while these young men knew all of the facts about their faith, 
They knew the data. They knew the, 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 the stuff. They didn't see how any of that mattered how any of that corresponded to the needs of their life, to the questions that they had. Now you have to remember this is Italy in the 1950s. This is a time when the church was at its great institutional strength. Seemingly, looking at society, looking at the, the, the role and influence of the church in political life, one would think that everything was great. Indeed, the church was broadly catechized. But I think it's safe to say while catechized, many were not evangelized. For many, as for these young men that Father Giussani spoke to, Christ remained an idea, an abstraction, something out there, not a present presence, not one who has taken flesh and who dwells among us. And so as a result, Christianity was seen either as moralism, a set of sort of arbitrary rules, or pietism, a set of sort of emotional, pious practices. But it certainly wasn't seen as the correspondence, as the answer to the needs of the human heart, as having relevance to everything in life. As a result of these encounters, Monsignor Giussani asked for permission from his superiors to leave this track, teaching in seminary, and to go to teach in high school. He went to teach in the Liceo Berche, a prestigious high school in Milan that at that time had many students under the influence of the popular Marxist ideology. Into their lives came this priest who approached them not with catechism and Bible, but with music and literature. His approach was different. They said to him, well, he has nothing to offer us. They didn't want what it was that he had to offer. But as Don Juice told them, I'm not here so that you can make my ideas your own, but to teach you a true method by which you can judge the things I tell you. He responded to their rejection or their hesitancy to the faith by seeking to show that the faith was not only reasonable, but indeed the only reasonable response to the totality of the needs of the human heart to the needs of the human person. Christianity was not merely a moralism or a pietism, but an encounter with a person, with Jesus Christ. He didn't want his students just to know things or to agree with a set of ideas or propositions, but to test for themselves what he was claiming and if what he proposed fulfilled the needs of their hearts. As one of his students put it, it was evident that he wanted something from us. That man wanted our hearts. What came of this experience teaching high school was an educational method that has continued in the life of the movement that he founded. In the most basic terms, the educational method can be understood as this. The church is the continuation in history of Christ's presence. And so through the church, we encounter the reality of Christ. We are handed on a tradition. This is a fact, a series of facts that are given to us. The church communicates these proposals to us, gives us an account of reality. The work of education is testing how these objective proposals given by the church, the objective proposals of faith, are verified through our lived experience, testing them against the needs of the heart. Does what the church proposes correspond to the deepest needs of the human heart? In this method, Jasani bets everything on the human, everything on our freedom, and tests everything against our experience. If we truly believe that what the church proposes is true, and if we truly believe that the human heart is universal, that is to say the same heart that exists in me, the same needs that exist in me, exists in you, then what we propose will match up, will correspond to our needs. Now this requires, of course, that nothing is bracketed out, that nothing is ignored 
that we consider all of the factors. And so the great challenge then is not our humanity, but is a series of sort of false proposals, false alternatives to the needs of the heart. In a word, ideology, which brackets out the fullness of our needs and says, no, this is all you need. This fulfills all of your answers and blinds us to the whole of reality, proposing an incomplete substitute in place of the infinite longing of our heart. Our heart was created for the infinite, and so nothing aside from the infinite can satisfy. Now, if you listen to this, you may think, well, doesn't that take a huge risk? Doesn't what happens if they get it wrong? It's true. This method is indeed a great risk, but this risk is essential. Without risking the test of human experience, without risking the reality of human freedom, without being able to hold up the objective proposal of faith to the scrutiny of our lived experience, we ultimately cannot have a mature faith. That is to say, Christianity remains at the level of an idea. We have some expression of it, but we don't have the fullness of it. Just a brief word about my own experience. I first met Father Gisani when I was in seminary, not in person, but in books. He had died several years before I even entered priestly formation. I met him through a fellow seminarian who was a guy who was sort of strange but very fascinating. One of these people who you want to know more about. You want to, what makes them who they are. And so a friend of mine said, well, he runs this like book club, so you should go to that. So I did. I went to this book club and they were reading this small, incredibly confusing book called At the Origin of the Christian Claim. I had no idea what Father Gisani was saying in this book. I didn't even know if I really liked what he was saying in that book. But I looked around the table and I realized I like the guys in this room. I like the questions that they ask. I like the fact that they're open to questions, that they are willing to look at their experience, to test things against their experience, that they don't have the same kind of black-white thinking that a lot of my classmates tended to have. So because of that, I just kept going. And as I read more and more, I, I got to understand more and more. I started to realize what this guy was saying a little bit. But as I began to follow these, this book club, which I later came to realize was called School of Community, I realized that I liked this community. I liked these people. There was something about them that appealed to, to me, that, that, that matched with what I was, was looking for. Later on, a priest of the movement came to teach in the seminary the following year. And through him, we began to be involved in the broader life of, of this movement that Father Jassani had founded. What appealed to me was that they gave a way for me to be both faithful to what the church proposed, but to do so with a great freedom. To do so in a way that my humanity was not bracketed out or was not cast aside, but rather was the, the way, the, 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 the window through which the Lord came to me, made things known to me. Father Jassani once said that he never intended to found anything, but rather all he desired to do was to live an original experience of Christianity, an elementary experience of Christianity. But from that desire, something was born. And in many ways, Father Jassani translated the best thought and writing of many figures who came before him and many of his contemporary, contemporaries into a way of life. I think last week, Father, or last month, Father Brendan quoted uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who allegedly said something to the effect of, I, I wrote books, uh, he founded a people. And the people that he found started with this group of students this group of Father Giussani's students, originally known as GS, Givantu Studentesca. And as they matured, the reality of history would give birth to something else. These students were, many of them, in university in the midst of the 1968 student revolutions. And so a group of Father Giussani's students penned a pamphlet that would become the name of the movement, Communion and Liberation. And in it, 
they identified with many of the desires of their fellow students, their student revolutionaries, but proposed that real liberation comes not from the ideologies of the world, which give an incomplete answer to the needs of the human heart, but from communion, from a life of communion, that our truest freedom comes from belonging. Today, this charism lives on in the midst of a communion, a companionship, a movement known as communion and liberation. We're very blessed here in Baltimore to have a, a very small but, but beautiful school of community, a, a group of people who gather every week to engage in this work of, of testing what the church has proposed against the reality of our experience and of keeping each other in front of that, in front of, of our own experience. Tonight, we wanted to share not only the figure of Father Gisani, our founder, but also the companionship that has come from his charism that is alive in the church today. As I mentioned before, some of the members of our School of Community are here and would be very happy to speak with you after the talk. But to conclude, we've asked one of our friends, Rachel, to offer a brief witness on who Father Gisani is to her, how she has encountered his charism, and what that means for her life. Let's welcome Rachel. Um, hello, good evening. Um, like Father Tyler said, my name is Rachel. Um, I'm a parishioner here at the Basilica and part of the uh, community, the Communion and Liberation Community, also known as CL. I will refer to it as CL, um, here in Baltimore. Uh, and I'm here to share my experience um, with Father Giussani through um, my living in this community. Uh, when Father Tyler first asked me to do this, uh, I was a bit surprised as I was, I have grown up in, in the CL community um, my whole life and don't have any great encounter story or experience, um, I guess, I would think worthwhile to tell me. Um, it's been a very normal part of my faith formation. Um, all I've done is follow the way of living uh, that my parents, that my parents uh, taught me, uh, just following them and, and our friends. And for me, it seems very simple, and it, I've taken it for granted. Um, but I, once he asked me, um, and after reflecting, I realized that yes, um, it's very simple. This is just how I've I've lived the faith. But the fact that I've followed it for however many years now, there must be something significant in that. And the fact that I've chosen to follow this, this charism and this community, um, I haven't, yeah, because there's something meaningful there for me. Uh, so I'll share with you my, my simple story of who Father Giustani is for me and his role in my faith journey. <clears throat> Having grown up in CL, um, I could very easily go through a timeline of my experience and explain the different groups we have and things we do, um, but it's, that's not that interesting and I don't think that'll show Father Jasani. Instead, I want to use a few recent experiences um, to express two facts that Father Jasani, through this community, has taught me. And I hope that these experiences also help explain what Father Tyler was talking about. Um, so the first thing is the import that he taught me is the importance of community within the context of the faith of belonging to something more than just myself. Um, Father Giussani believed that faith lived out in communion is a foundation of the true liberation of man because it's true, through one another that we're able to meet Christ in the flesh and experience his love for us. I can say that this has been true for me in my own experience, uh, in particular moving up to Baltimore. I moved up here in January from the Bethesda Montgomery County area, uh, which isn't that far but it meant leaving my friends and family, the people I had grown up with my whole life, uh, and who know me very well. Uh, I didn't really know many people here and didn't know what to expect in terms of forming a community and living out my faith um, from CL. Uh, and I could see that easily, I, I could have easily felt alone in that and been isolated. However, I knew that there was a, a, a CL community up here, and though I didn't know them well, we shared this common experience of the charism, uh, and so I should go and see who they are. And so I did, and it was only then, even after being in, in part of CL for 
for many years that I understood that I understood the importance of community in my life and in my ability to encounter Christ. Because what I found in this community uh, is a bunch of people from very different backgrounds, different histories, different points in life, uh, but who share the same desire for Christ and for Christ to penetrate our lives. Um, and these people who follow this desire through, th through living out the, teaching, the teachings of Father Dusami. In sharing my life with them this year and in belonging to this community and these friendships, I have seen more clearly that it's through community that my own desire for Christ is educated and formed in a way that I could not do myself, and that being part of a community helps me to live out my faith in the world with a confidence and certainty of this truth that I would not have alone. Uh, the second fact or lesson <clears throat> is just like that, just like how the apostles needed each other to follow and stay with Christ, I too need particular people and faces to continually show me Christ, to remind me of my desire for him, and to help me to re-encounter him. Um, I saw this very clearly a few weekends ago when a group of my friends went out to Colorado to celebrate our friend's wedding. Uh, being in Colorado, it was assumed that we had to go hiking. Um, but also, being in Colorado in the first weekend of November, um, it meant lots of snow and apparently a ton of wind. Um, so the first morning we woke up, it was like 25 degrees, at least 40 miles an hour winds. Uh, and in my head that meant, no way we're hiking. We're staying in, I'm reading a book with some coffee. We're going to be nice and comfortable. Um, but for my friends, there was no question. We're going hiking. Uh, not because we needed to show off that we could brave the weather, that we were like tough enough, uh, but because we knew there was something beautiful for us to see. Um, so we went, me and my running sneakers and very light winter gear, uh, which I think if people saw us, they would have thought we were crazy. Um, and at the beginning in my head, that's what I was thinking. This is crazy. It's too cold. It's windy and I can't hear anything or feel my feet. <laughs> Uh, we should just go back. Uh, and I expected all my friends to be com doing the same, complaining um, of their suffering as well and ex eventually to accept defeat. Instead, um, what I heard was first silence as we kind of got to grips with everything, um, then sounds of laughter at the absurdity of what we were doing, and then of excitement and wonder at it all, at the power of the wind, the blueness of the sky, the depth of the snow, um, all of this was, was, was full of joy and curiosity. Um, like, like Father Tyler was saying, or what Jusani's mother was saying, how beautiful is the world and how great is God. That was the, that was the attitude. Watching my friend's reaction to this and their experience of the joy opened my own eyes to the beauty of this moment. Both the beauty of the mountains and the view, but also the beauty of sharing this moment with friends, of sharing the gift that that moment was for, for each of us. It was clear that Christ was there with us, pushing us to see something greater, beyond the cold, beyond our own limits, something that really did correspond to our hearts. In this moment, I felt like the apostles, not really sure what we were doing, where we were going, who kind of we were following, but certain that there was someone who was leading us and taking care of us, and that certainty made it all worth it. The joy of that moment and of that companionship stayed with us the rest of the weekend, as we shared this story with others with great excitement and energy that was not our own, that we could not have generated ourselves, and that, that I would not have experienced without these friends, without these particular faces. So these are just two simple examples to show what Father Giussani has taught me through my life in the Communion and Liberation Movement. Through this community and particular people, Father Giussani has provided me a way to live out my Catholic faith in the world and in the circumstances I've been given a gift that I'm extremely grateful for and hold dear to my heart. And I'm very glad to have been able to share this with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. As I mentioned, uh, we have along the side here a number of panels from an exhibit that we had this year at the New York Encounter, which is a, a cultural event we have every, uh, every winter up in, in New York City. So it's a series of panels on an exhibit on the life of Father Giussani. We also have a, a small booklet uh, that has more information and, and some, some of the writings of, of Monsignor Giussani. Uh, some of us will be in the back uh, after as well to 
to have conversation, to answer questions uh, that you may have. Thank you so much for, for being here, for, uh, for listening, and, and for, for hearing a bit about uh, Monsignor Giussani. God bless you.